Hi. Hi, is it Mattia? It's Mattia, actually. Mattia. First syllable. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Good. I mean, I'm at home. You and you're in quarantine. Yeah, I'm. I'm in quarantine in my apartment here in Munich. So. Okay. And you are originally from Croatia. Yeah, I'm from Zagreb, born and raised in Zagreb. Ah, okay. I've actually photographed uh, quite a few musicians from Croatia. Yeah, I've seen um, from Giuseppe. I've seen his photos. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, great, great photos. I mean, very, um, very specific. I would say. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, why are you in quarantine at the moment? I have uh, on next Friday, on the twentieth, mm -hmm. we have a live stream from Gerhard Platz Theater. Mm -hmm. So, I had to come two weeks earlier to do the quarantine for five days. And then from the Monday, I will have some rehearsals. And then on Friday, I have a concert where I sing two, two things. And uh, then I'm you know, free until the next thing they figure out. So. Oh, OK. Do you get tested as well um, at the theater uh, every day? Or how do they do the testing? I had to do the test directly when I came. Okay. Uh, so I went, I came on Sunday, Monday morning, I went to Deutsches Museum to have PCR test. And tomorrow morning, I have a second PCR test after five days, so I can shorten the quarantine. Mm -hmm. And at the theater, they have voluntary testing. But oh, voluntary. A, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. They, they, um, they, they, I think they're uh, part of a pilot project um, something called Google test, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so they're collaborating with, uh, with a doctor who put together this Google test. And they said it's, um, it's basically the same thing as PCR test. So they're giving the test kits to artists who then do the test at home. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So you can do the test yourself. Mm -hmm. And then they two times a week they they um, they take all the samples and then check them. Oh wow! So that, oh, but that that's that's actually much better then. I I still haven't haven't done it, so I. I oh don't know. okay okay so <laughs> so you 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 will see how yeah, it they, works yeah. I think they did it yesterday. Um, yeah, yesterday they mm -hmm. did it, and uh, probably they will do it next week sometime. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah. Um, I, I would just like to know first, um, how did you start in music? What age were you when you first started? Um, I started by accident. Okay. <laughs> I actually started by accident because I was an altar boy in mm -hmm. the church in Zagreb. Mm -hmm. So I was an altar boy in my parish. And as when I was 13, I think I was the oldest of altar boys. So mm -hmm. I had the obligation to go once a week on a meeting with other groups, like people who were reading in a church, people who were doing other things. There was once a week meeting of all the groups. Mm -hmm. And I got it wrong. Instead of going one day, I went the other day, and I ended up okay. walking in the practice of church choir. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was seventh grade, 13. Mm -hmm. And I saw a guy in, in a choir whom I knew from my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. was, I knew that he was playing guitar and we listened to a certain type of music. So we knew each other mm -hmm. from our neighborhood. And he said, I'll just come over and we'll do some noise. Mm. So I went and started warming up with the choir as a practical joke. Mm. And then the guy who was choir leader at the time, I remember him looking at me. And when the warm up was done, he said, you will stay. And I said, I'm an altar boy. He said, I don't care. Wow. And afterwards, <laughs> he called mm -hmm. my mother. We still mm -hmm. had like phones this big. Mm -hmm. He called my mother and he said, 
Mattia will stay for a choir. I'm, I'm a choir leader. Mattia will stay for a choir rehearsal. I want him in a choir. And so he basically made me, okay. made me do it. Yeah. So then I started, uh, I started in a church choir and on the, after the first rehearsal, he said to me, you will be an opera singer one day. And I wow. was laughing. I was laughing. I was like, no way. Because he was singing in opera mm. choir and uh, comprimario tenor roles in mm. Zagreb. And after a certain time, the choir leader changed and came the guy who, parallel with the church youth choir, organized also a, a gospel group. Mm -hmm. And when I was 16, he invited me to join the gospel group. So I started as a gospel bass mm -hmm. and just fell in love with that. Wonderful. When I was 17, the same guy said to me, you know, you have to go and educate your voice. You are too specific not to do that. Mm -hmm. So I said, no. <laughs> Why? And I just never saw myself. In oh, that. okay. I was, you never I, had your family, your, your family, um, do they do music, any of your family members? Nothing. Actually, the other side of my family, which means mm. like my cousins, mm. um, they were much more prolific in music. And I was al always um, the guy who, because I went to science gymnasium, mm. I was always the guy who was like more science, mathematics, physics, chemistry oriented. So my That's parents, interesting. Knew, yeah. yeah, my parents knew always that I have a good voice, but I was um, always much more interested in basketball and stuff mm. like that. Mm. So, so that choir leader, he said, you will either go to music school mm. or I will throw you out from the choir and from the gospel group. Wow. And I was, I was like, okay, mm. okay, whatever. And he brought me to my first teacher. Um, who asked me, what, what do you want to be? And I said, mm -hmm. I want to be a gospel bass. Mm -hmm. She looked at me and she said, you know, there is no gospel scene. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you will not be able to work. And I said, well, well, then I will be the first. And she said, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. And she took me in. And we in Croatia will still have this communist um, heritage of music mm -hmm. schools that for very very little money you can enroll and go parallel with your Grundschule you can go parallel to music Grundschule and parallel with your um, gymnasium or how do you call it mm -hmm. it's not Schule but middle, middle Schule yeah you yeah parallel to music middle Schule and then there is music academy mm -hmm. so but for singers, there is four years of music high school and two years of uh, Vorbereitung. Mm. So I went all six years. I, I finished my gymnasium in the meantime and started studying mechanical engineering. So machinismus or mm. machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and very quickly, uh, I mean, in the first year of studying voice, in this uh, music high school, um, I won the second prize in the national competition. Amazing. So I, was kind of, I yeah. got the immediate yeah. information that, you know, I could, I could be good maybe. Yeah, yeah. And the teacher I had, um, we just, we two had an amazing connection. Mm -hmm. She was, and she still is, like one of the most influential people in my life. And what is her name? Victoria Badrov. Okay. She's a very well known teacher in Zagreb mm -hmm. of this, let's say, medium level school. Yeah. And she very quickly, teachers from Music Academy started calling her to send me to Music Academy. Mm. and she said no <laughs> so I Why? stayed with her 
because um, she said to me, look, um, it's very rare that teacher and student have that good a connection. Mm. And she said, the moment when I feel that you are not going forward with your development, you can go. Mm. And I agreed. And so I spent six years and got my music uh, diploma with her. Mm. And then I went to uh, Academy of Zagreb uh, in 2010, oh. where I studied mm -hmm. for three years. And then I went for one year in Erasmus in, in, in uh, Hochschule in, in, in Wien, in Universität in Wien, mm -hmm. uh, where I spent one year in Erasmus. And then I came back for one year in Zagreb and finished my master's studies. Oh. Mm -hmm. But in the last year of studying this, this music high school, she said, you have to go and find another teacher because I came to kind of limit. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so she went, knew, yeah. So, I, so I, and at that time I went and did my audition for opera choir. Mm -hmm. And on that audition, they offered me Shonar mm -hmm. and one other role. So I basically started singing in opera choir and being a soloist at the same time. That is and incredible, yeah. Two weeks later, I went to, I gathered some money because I sang, um, I sang in funerals at the mm. time mm. when I was 22. So yeah. I, I gathered some money and I went for one week in Vienna mm -hmm. in painting to listen to all different teachers and had some really amazing uh, experiences. And there I met Claudia Visca, mm -hmm. probably heard of. Mm -hmm. She's a very well-known teacher in, in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And we just clicked the, the first moment. And then I started working privately with, with her. And at the same time, I was studying in Music Academy in Zagreb with George Surian, who is very well-known Croatian bass baritone. Mm -hmm. Also sang in Vienna a lot, Metropolitan, all over, Scala. Mm -hmm. So I studied with two of them parallelly. And both of them, um, I still, when I have some um, new roles or some things that I have to check, I go to Vienna to study with Frau Wiska. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. And with Surian, I did, he was extremely instrumental mm -hmm. to help me because at the, at the same time I was starting with my stage career. So I was singing roles like Shonar or Belcore or uh, Barbiere di Sevilla and stuff like that. And he helped me enormously with how to sing on stage, which is different from how to sing in the room. Mm. And since he is a great actor, he, we were actually at the same production as a teacher and student in Music Academy. We were hired professionally at the same production. Wow, so that must have been amazing. That was, yeah, that was mm. one of the, one of the most um, important experiences mm. for me because he he was Dul Kamara and I was Belcore in Elisir and you know I would do a scene and then he would say and, he would oh, say, okay. yeah. and when you're yeah. doing that bigger and this but mm -hmm. don't forget you know and mm. so he was very extremely helpful mm. I graduated my master's degree with him. Um, and yeah, and one other teacher that I have is the teacher that I married, and that's my wife. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I met my wife uh, in music high school. Yeah. It was in the same class with Frau Badrov. Mm -hmm. And um, so we met when we were 17. Mm -hmm started being a couple maybe we were 21 yeah. and since then we are together for 13 years and um she's a mezzo soprano and uh, mm -hmm. she she's extremely helpful because you know we grew up basically together and um, oh, yeah. we are more or less uh, each other's teachers all the time that's well i'm in love with love so anything like this is for me a beautiful story yeah <laughs> Yeah, we were, um, Martina and I, when we first met, we first met on the entering exam or audition mm -hmm. 
for music high school in Zagreb. Wow. And uh, we started together. And um, yeah, we sang in, together in different choirs. Mm -hmm. We traveled around the world with, with some choirs. We, um, you know, um, yeah. And then after a couple of years, we started being a couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, it's just, um, yeah, we are, we are inseparable. <laughs> so it's it's good is it for you good in that sense that uh, you you are with somebody who understands and who understands what it's what it's all about and and your pressure absolutely. and yeah absolutely I'm not um, I mean um, you know almost every rehearsal that I do I record uh, with my phone. And then I send it to her and then say, so what do you think about this? What do you think about oh, that? Yeah, yeah. So I have someone who is kind of guiding me constantly on the same path. Yeah. And, and what is really specific is that she's a similar, she's the same voice type as I am, just mm -hmm. in female, um, in female world. So she's mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, deeper mezzo soprano as I'm a deeper baritone. oh okay yeah so we have the same um good sides and the same issues oh okay so and since we know each other since we were kids mm. um basically Martina is the best judge mm. of exactly how should I sound oh I see Oh, so she knows your voice very well then. Yeah, and and <laughs> I'm very lucky. She's extremely honest. Mm. Some people, some colleagues are just like appalled when they hear something that she says to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I get, you know, I sometimes I get in the middle of performance, I get uh, a text message with, oh, that was great. Keep doing this. Yeah. Don't do that. Watch out. And... Um, and she's the biggest support and she's like um, somebody who I trust myself mm. the most, you know, with. So. Well, somebody... she can, she can be a bit harsh because afterwards she can kiss you to make up. So that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, I think that being honest is mm. the, the best path to success. Yeah. Because I also learned with time to be very honest with myself. Mm. And um, she's the first person, if, I, if something is good, who will not be, you know, not trying to fake it as, yeah. Uh, yeah. oh, I don't care, or mm. whatever, who will be very supportive if something is good. And who yeah. will just say, okay, just keep doing that and let's go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the problem, I think, with my voice type is that it changes a lot mm -hmm. in terms of um, every five years, you know, I, I feel big change in the voice. Really? Mm -hmm. Just at the moment when I think, oh, now I, mm -hmm. now I really have a technical grasp, 100% I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. then you wake up some, one day and then you're 30. And oh, then okay. the book starts being much mm -hmm. more heavy. And then, you know, I will be 35 in October. Um, I mean, it has been a huge change from 27 to 34. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm really blessed to have someone firsthand who can say, look, mm -hmm. try, to do this, try to do that. This is great. Keep doing that. Don't forget this. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, teachers that um, I still visit. I also work with um, Italian bass called Lorenzo Regazzo, mm -hmm. an awesome teacher. And uh, I started going and visiting him in uh, Venezia just before COVID and mm -hmm. started working on really Italian repertoire that, it, that will probably be um, in my future. But you so know, always... mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. This is this is so amazing for me that uh, uh, to hear this because you know this is the thing that I feel very strongly about is that 
artists speak about these things uh, and that, you know, people like me who don't know the music industry and, and so much about the music, uh, you know, that, that we understand that being an artist and a singer is, you know, this very, this, it's very involved and it's not just, uh, there's so many things you have to deal with and work on and it is a constant, uh, constant uh, learning process. And um, and I think my my whole um, a thought process about this is that this is what I've discovered uh, also in this time that I photographed all the the artists is that I didn't realize all this, and of course from hearing and speaking with everybody that I uh, understand that that uh, that part that you're on the stage is only a small part of of the whole process you know and I think I have this feeling that when people know more of this story or this side that they would also appreciate more what the artists do and you know and, and value the 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 arts or the artists you know, because I think art is being valued, but not the artist as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I feel I feel very big connection with um, with with people who are in sports, mm. um, especially opera world and uh, American football, mm. because in American football you have only 16 games in the regular season because it's a pretty violent sport mm. and but you have to train the whole year to be able to play only 16 years and there is a saying that says and they usually play on sunday mm. there is a saying that says you don't pay me to play on sunday you pay me to train the whole week oh yeah yeah so also in opera you know you you study a role for months mm. really months and then when you kind of know it, then you start stage rehearsals. Mm. And that also in the process of finding the character in your body, sometimes it disrupts what you've been doing in your rehearsal room. Mm. So then you have six weeks or eight weeks of rehearsals. That's also two months. Mm. And then in the end, you have five shows. Mm. So um, yeah, the the shows and that what the audience sees, especially because you know, stage is a three dimensional space, mm. and a lot of things happen around the stage in your dressing room with your colleagues. Sometimes some accidents happen, and the audience that looks at it just two dimensional picture from their seats are yeah. really not aware of it. Mm. So you basically, I would also say, um, it's just the tip of an iceberg, what the audience yeah. see. So when they say, you know, oh, um, you know, sometimes opera singers uh, earn very good money per performance. Mm -hmm. The thing is that you don't pay me for per performance. You pay yeah. me for all other months <laughs> of studying, yeah. you know, trying to translate something from uh, Italian that is completely different than Italian that is now or from German that is from mm. you know, 200 years ago or trying to understand that or some very complex music that you have to learn everything by heart mm. as, as an opera singer or so and you know we we wake we singers we wake up every day with a different instrument mm. I every day when you wake up, you're like, oh, <clears throat> what's hmm, I, I, how are we today? Yeah. <laughs> you know, a piano is a piano. Yeah. And you have this this space is a C and this space mm. is a D. And it's guaranteed, if piano is of course tuned, that it will be like that. Yeah. We singers, we depend on so many different uh things, you know. Um I don't think any pianist ever broke his leg or her leg during mm. the performance. I broke my ankle during the performance. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> How did you manage that? And and what could you sing then afterwards again? Yeah. I mean, I, actually, I, I mean, in that performance. Yeah, I finished the performance. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was singing Leporello in um, here in Munich, yeah. and in one scene I had to, after sextet in the second act, I had to open the trapdoor, mm. and I had to jump in Unterbühne. Mm -hmm. And there was like a plateau with a you know soft thing, and everything was really secure. So I jumped mm -hmm. 100 times, and 100 the first time my leg did that when I landed. Yeah. So my ankle, yeah, broke. Yeah. And uh, there was you know there was a lot of because afterwards Don Elvira comes and closes this mm -hmm. this trapdoor. Mm. And between me jumping and her coming, there was, you know, there was a lot of screaming. Oh. Uh, underneath. <laughs> a lot of Croatian swearing. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I finished the whole thing because I, mm. um, you know, it, it was warm. So I didn't, my, my muscles were warm. So I didn't feel that much pain. Yeah. But the next morning, uh, the next morning I couldn't, I couldn't go from my bed to the bathroom. So, um, and I, my theater was extremely um, gracious and they, mm -hmm. I, I immediately had like um, uh, the best uh, orthopedist in Munich. Oh, okay. In yeah. They found a replacement because I was supposed to have two shows back to back. Oh. But they found a replacement very quickly and, you know, they, they did everything um, to um, kind of um, cover for me. But, mm. um, you know, these things but happen. You, uh, yeah, and, and you can, I mean, you can, uh, you can almost expect that to happen when you do sport, but you, you don't expect that to happen, you know, yeah. on, on a stage. But, of course, I mean, I worked in the, at the Staatsoper. Uh, backstage and I understand what's going on behind the scenes so I can yeah. just imagine what <laughs> the, yeah, the I mean, panic there was with yeah yeah I mean also um I've seen you know people fainting or you know in some big scenes that um people got hit in the head with something or I had uh, you know I had mm -hmm. so so many times I had like like um, um, bloody elbows or knees from doing something or yeah you know um so th these are things that, that happen on a regular mm -hmm. basis unfortunately mm -hmm. but they happen you know yeah. so not, yeah. it's not unusual but uh, uh yeah it happens yeah it happens yeah uh, yeah, but that's that's um, yeah. I mean, this is what I'm saying. You know, there's many there are many things that that the public don't know about that yeah. you know, when they when they watch. And of course, you know, but uh, when you sing, it sounds so easy and it sounds so you know effortless. And uh, but it's the reason why it sounds so effortless is because you've rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and. Yeah. And practiced, and you know, and trained, and did everything. So yeah, um, yeah. it's like it's basically like like people in sports. You know, somebody who plays basketball, he doesn't think about ball going up and down. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Somebody who plays soccer, he's watching downfield and not yeah. just like. So that's basically what also we need to do. The preparation needs to be. I I prefer that. Um, yeah. So I try to always start with my roles at least six months in advance, mm. you know, to like really be really prepared. Prepared, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but tell me, um, what, what did you, where were you when, when uh, lockdown was announced? Were you in Munich? I, um, a year ago in February and March, I had mm. a lot of back and forth between Munich and Zagreb because in Zagreb I recorded some things with radio television choir I recorded mm -hmm. some some uh, cantata as a soloist with them yeah and I also recorded some Croatian lead for mm -hmm. uh, music archives and at the same time I had a lead album in Munich and we had a concert for Orf yes mm -hmm. something like that mm -hmm. so um 
the last thing I did before the lockdown was this little concert for um, this ORF society. Mm -hmm. uh, we did excerpts from the Kluge. Okay. Because we were playing it the whole the whole season that, that mm -hmm. show. So I came, I think, 8th of March, 9th of March, March, I sang that thing and then stayed to coach, to have coachings you know, with Onyegin mm. in Munich. And basically on the 10th of March, I got a call from a friend who said Croatia is going to close the borders. Really? So I, I, I got a call around noon mm. and I immediately... Uh, went and uh, my intendant said, yeah, we are probably going to be closed for a month or so. Mm. <laughs> so he released me to go and be with my family in Zagreb. So I oh, bought okay. a train ticket, went that day straight to Zagreb. Mm. And two days afterwards, uh, everything was closed. So, but uh, did you, did you, um, uh, was it a bit surreal for you when you first heard it? Or did Absolutely. you expect it almost? Was there rumors no. before you didn't expect no. it? I think no. I, I personally thought it's just a precaution. Yeah. So let's see, you know, for a month or two, you know, just let's be careful. Mm. So I didn't really think that it will become this kind of global thing as it became and these these um um projects that were going to happen they all had been cancelled then by then by that time in 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 getneplatz theater i was scheduled mm. to have completely free april and may mm. so it was you know every season oh i see okay yeah, and yeah. March, April, and May were basically. Um, I had a couple of La Boheme mm. performances and something else. Can't remember, but it was pretty much you know uh, months where I was kind of expecting to go and and oh, do some okay. guest appearances. Yeah. And I had uh, something scheduled in Dubrovnik, actually mm. with Dubrovnik Symphonic Orchestra and with my wife. We were supposed to sing concerts. I was supposed to have some recitals in in Croatia and uh, something else, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, the whole COVID situation, I have to, to, prefaces, to preface it with saying that I'm a member of the ensemble in mm -hmm. Gerna Plaza. So I wasn't so hit okay as most of um as a lot of artists mm. so in freelancers terms of, yeah you know, they said oh we have to postpone some performances and i said okay yeah will we be financially you know um hit no mm. we are start start are good okay let yeah. me know let me know what are the next steps mm. my wife for example she had a lot of things canceled mm. but um, is she freelance? Uh, is she yeah. freelance? Okay. Yeah. Mm. So she was supposed to sing, for example, uh, Mala Achte Symphony in uh, Berlin Philharmonie and Elb Philharmonie. Um, she was supposed to sing some other concerts in Croatia. So it was really, uh, it was more difficult for her than for me. And I would say we, as a family, we, we were very lucky that mm. I'm a member of the ensemble. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Gatna Platz Theater has been um, really great in fighting for their artists. Really? Oh, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my point of view. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe somebody else had a different point of view, but that's my point but of view. We, that I, yeah. So basically, um, I was supposed to have April and May free to go and audition for other things. And mm. I had an audition scheduled, but they unfortunately didn't happen. Mm. So the worst thing for me is that I didn't get to develop um, the career in um, some other places. 
Oh, okay. But, yeah. Uh, comparing to you know, comparing to people who are uh, Italian or a lot of French people or American, especially. Yeah, America. I mean, yeah. I I can only say good things about the system in mm -hmm. Germany. Um, there are some things that you know could be better. Yeah. Um, or my personal opinion is that there is, I don't see really a huge need for the theaters to be closed mm. because there, there were so many uh, scientific and experiments who have a scientific proof that COVID is not spread and people seeing the concert mm. or stage performances. Mm when we continued in June and July, mm -hmm. um, Gatman Plus Data, we had um, so many different pro um, kind of new projects that they, mm -hmm. that they, um, uh, uh, how do you say, they created. Yeah. We had small 30 minute concerts with piano uh, for like 15 people. Mm -hmm. And those were very exclusive, and they connected it with a story about Ludwig Zweite, uh, who had, you know, theaters closed, and he was the only member of the audience. Oh, okay. Then we had three completely um, uh, different um, modules of concerts with the orchestra that were on stage. So mm -hmm. basically, the audience was in the Hinterbühne watching uh, towards Proscenium. Mm -hmm. And on the proscenium, there was orchestra and the soloists. So the audience oh. was watching in the audience. Oh, so I see. In, yeah. In Hinterbühne, so they got to see how it all looks yeah. behind the stage. And we had semi-staged concerts uh, mm -hmm. with uh, opera, operetta, and um, a musical module. Mm -hmm. You know, Sometimes mm -hmm. we had two a day. Like I would have the concert at mm -hmm. 6 till 7.15 half an hour break, concert at eight. That's what uh, we did when it was uh, 100 or 200 people allowed. Mm. And then we staged this uh, Orfs Kluge that was um, designed for a smaller second stage that we have in our house. It mm. was put on the big stage and uh, some other things. I can't really remember what they did. Um, I think uh, one operetta and one musical they did. But anyway, um, so Gerdner Plastata found really creative ways mm. to, to, you know, make, to a, make a solution. Yeah. And but this is amazing um, that, they, that, they, uh, that they thought of that and not just, yeah. you know. So they were yeah. extremely creative yeah. and, you know, they, were, they asked uh, the staff, mm. um, conductors and pianists and soloists to give, like, can you give some ideas? Ideas, what yeah. So, uh, you know, we did uh, like concerts with popular arias and duets and ensembles, mm. everybody keeping the distance and also joking about keeping the distance and, you know, yeah, yeah. everybody with their, with their disinfection things and, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. doing that. And I remember yeah. we did, on Barbiere di Sevilla, we did the first finale and I was singing Figaro and I had like a, you know, a meter. Mm. I was going from person to person and measuring the distance between. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, so yeah. The audience loved it, and yeah, and uh, the audience was extremely supportive. Mm. Extremely, all our concerts and semi-stage and stage operas were mm. ausverkauft in the matter of one day. That's amazing. And we had, yeah, and we had on the twenty-fourth of July. We had a finalissimo concert, like the best of the whole season. Mm. That was Austerkauf in four minutes and 33 seconds online. That's so, incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, the audience is so hungry mm. for those kind of things. And the audience was so disciplined. I mean, mm. there was zero cases mm. of people not wanting to wear masks, people not mm. wanting to keep the distance. Every, everything was just like so organized. Mm. Um, logistically great organized from the mm. theater side and the audience was amazing they just they they listened to everything what they what people said and they sat in their places with the masks mm. if they were required to 
So, so there was zero chance of yeah. anybody to get anything. People from uh, orchestra, extremely uh, disciplined, people from choir, mm -hmm. soloists, um, Gärtnerplatz also, they ordered new arrangements for some arias and some operas mm -hmm. so they could reduce the orchestra. And mm -hmm. then in fall, we did the new production of Evgeny Onegin that was specially designed on stage so nobody touches. So I, as wow. a Nyegin, yeah. I never touched Tatiana in two and a half hours. And it worked. Really? Yeah, and um, but... ben, Bauer, ben Bauer, who was the director, he managed yeah. to put on the show that was emotional and mm. you know, so passionate and everything mm. we never touched. And that's Jordan, incredible. Yeah. It was ausverkauft, like 10, 10 performances were ausverkauft in advance. And um, so I personally, in this situation, I don't really see the reason why we cannot do our jobs. Yeah. But I, I also um, thought about this, about the theatres, um, you know, even before this pandemic, if I think um, every time I visited the, the Staatsoper to, to look at a performance, to watch a performance, mm -hmm. um, you don't, you never have the impression that people overcrowd anyway. I don't know, it's, it, maybe it was the space that was available, but I never, I, I never have the feeling that in a theater people, it's almost as if people have this natural um, respect for each other to, to keep the distance, you know, it's um, in the, the audience. And I think now, even in this situation, people are automatically more aware of it and are more aware to not um, be too close to each other. So, um, you know, this is this is really something that that uh, that's also interesting. That you say that the theater was able to do something creative in this situation, and this is my also my uh, uh, the, the point that I want to make is that artists have a different way of of uh, looking at things and solving problems and. Um, you know, it's almost as if you have the skills to to overcome situations like this. You know, uh, um, I, I I I honestly believe that that by uh, through this career that you have, that you that you develop these skills to to motivate yourself, to to persevere, to overcome obstacles, to uh, you know. So it's it's you are best equipped, I think, for this time. Um, I find also, the, you know, that that artists are very much positive uh, in in many ways, and I mean, I understand it's also, you know, you, you get to that point where you feel a bit depressed, but overall, the attitudes I find is quite positive. Well, my 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 opinion is that. Um, people who are constantly on stage mm -hmm. in terms of being creative on stage, not, mm -hmm. you know, playing a concert. Yeah. You become very much aware of the spacing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because I have to be in my job. I have to spend as much time uh, trying to manage where am I in space yeah yeah um, as as much time as I am trying to you know see the conductor or you know because it's all interconnected mm. so it wasn't really it wasn't really so difficult to mm. restage the Kluge for example from off or to stage Onegin without touching hands. Mm. It wasn't that difficult. And um, it, it went rather quickly with mm. everybody. 
So I think that people who are on stage a lot, and especially uh, also people from the technique, you know, they were so quickly adaptable mm. to those things because it's a live theater. Things yeah. go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Normal things yeah. go wrong. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in an opera house where there are so many different things going on, there is orchestra, there is choir, there is there are soloists, there is techniques. There are people mm. who are producing the whole thing like uh, Schlosserei or Schneiderei. You know, yeah. there's so many moving parts at the same time that people who work there and people who, who are kind of managers, mm. they are, it's their daily job to try to mm. adjust all those things. Yeah. And or uh, people who work in bureau like Künstlerische uh, Betriebs Bureau, they're used to, uh, oh, this soloist is not here for today. He's there and she's there. And oh, mm. well, she got, she, uh, she got uh, invitation to jump in here and he's there and he's coming back tomorrow. But, you know, so my opinion is that um, at least what I saw from my theater, but also mm. from, from, from talking to other colleagues that, theaters are really well equipped as you said yeah. to those kind of things and yeah. uh, and uh, i i would be very i would i would i would be very happy if uh, different governments will start to believe in that mm. it's not it's not it's not we are not only you know clowns who just perform on stage yeah when you think about also clowns i mean uh, different audiences yeah. to different direction. Even if yeah. you are doing the same thing over and over again, or something that seems completely silly, mm. you, with the time you, you, or people who are, you know, stand-up comedians, with yeah. time you kind of learn how to read the room and to go with the audience and also to be adaptable. Today you're in this theater, tomorrow you're in that theater. Mm. It's called, it's warm, you know, plane is like yeah. it's warm whatever yeah. you didn't sleep much because your baby was crying the half of tonight and you have to perform yeah be happy and somebody died you know mm -hmm. so i would really love to see from you know leaders mm -hmm. to live more in theaters yeah. because in the end you know when you go to a different country or when you go to a different city the things you remember and the things you see the first are cultural things, mm. are gast gastronomy things. And those are things that are, you know, closed now. Yeah. Um, and my also opinion, what I'm trying also to, 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 to kind of, um, to be a prophet in Croatia is that, you know, you can really monetize that. Mm. You can really monetize the culture and, and cultural heritage. As you know, in Vienna, it's yeah. one product of Austria and Vienna is Mozart. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> this was, one, yeah, but this was, product. yeah, but this was what um, actually um, inspired me to, I say inspired, almost provoked me to do this project was that uh, uh, somebody, uh, initially when I started the project, I wanted to photograph, uh, it wasn't the, the intention just to photograph artists, I wanted to photograph people from all walks of life, but um, by the time that, or just before the shops and the restaurants opened, I wrote to somebody who had a shop and I wanted to photograph her. Uh, and she said, well, um, basically lockdown is over because the shops and the restaurants will be opening. And that was, you know, end of April, 1st of May. And that really sh uh, shocked me that, that somebody in Vienna could say that lockdown is over because the shops and the restaurants opened. But, but yeah, this is, you know, this, and, and, and then I decided, you know, when, when this, person said this then I this is what made me decide then to to go and take pictures of as many artists as possible that that I could reach because I thought this this should be a way of saying and and showing to to the world that 
this is where the, the artists are, you know, they are not in the theaters. And of course, yeah, what was so amazing was, uh, and this is this is now that you're saying, um, you know, that that are, you you are you are able to perform and you are able to to be on the spot. Um, so we would have a conversation. I would have a conversation with an artist about the situation, and and of course, in, in certain times in lockdown, it was worse than others. But the moment they get into the window, they just absolutely shine. You know, it's just like this energy comes from the window. And of course, I had critics saying to me that I project uh, the artists in a in a false light because they are all smiling. But you know, I've never asked any artist to smile. This is what they're giving me. You know, this I I never ask them to smile. They give it to me in this window. And this is amazing. And this is what I, I admire so much, you know, that even, even in this time, they can just make this switch and say, you know, here am I. And, and that's what you're talking about and in the theater as well. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why is that. Mm. But... Um... I'm not sure why is that that um, the cultural institutions and more um, specifically the audiences yeah. are not trusted. Mm. You know, um, I don't, I don't know the reason. Is mm. that, you know, because <laughs> during the last, I think, in in November, that German um, politician said. Somebody showed me the list. Um, the theaters, museums, and puffs are going to be closed. And I was like, really? Yeah. That's our category? Theaters, museums, and puffs? <laughs> I was <Yeah>. like, what? <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> is, that a, is that really yeah. a category? Bit, that we, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't... And also, I mean, if you have a stadium, soccer stadium, yeah. that has... 60,000 people and you don't, you can let 20,000, 2,000 people inside no matter what. Yeah, me. yeah. So I don't, I don't understand. And um, the difference is that, you know, Bayern München is mainly the most of the revenue gets through television mm. or through, you know, uh, these uh, fan uh, things that they buy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know we don't. Mm. We get most of the money from the audience. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't understand that. I, yeah. I really don't. Understand that. And also, I mean, I heard I heard so many different um, so many different experiences from different countries. Mm. For example, Croatia. What I find completely ridiculous, but it will be changed very soon. Mm. Heard, is that you know, we have a lot of cafe bars mm. and it's the culture of drinking coffee in cafe bar without having anything to eat. You know, it's not like um, um, like a Viennese cafe bar where you oh, okay. have yeah. a cake or something to eat. This is yeah, like yeah. The only drinks. Mm. That's, that's a huge part of the culture. Mm. And one of the anti-COVID measures was, okay, we are going to close all the bars and they're not allowed to sell coffee to go. However, restaurants are available mm. to sell coffee to go. And I was like, what? Well, yeah. How? Why is that? Go? Yeah. Or, um, you know, the theaters uh, in Zagreb and uh, the cultural venues can take, I think, up to 25 or 30 people. However, like a schwimmbad or, uh, you know, uh, beda where people go mm. to swim or to sauna or whatever, don't have any restrictions. That's, that's strange, yeah. Like I... <laughs> is that, the, is that yeah. the regulations at the moment? Yeah. In Croatia? Yeah. It's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. No, really, that is. That's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, 
um, weddings and churches are allowed, mm. but you know, not uh, concerts. Mm. Or concerts are very, you know, very reduced. Oh, okay. Um, so I don't really, I don't really get it. Me yeah. being, when I, go, when I go to Zagreb, I have a, I have a, a place in Zagreb Cathedral because I'm a soloist mm. in Zagreb Cathedral for the past 10 years. Mm. So um, I can go to church, but I cannot go to, uh, to, to a concert. That's, that's for me, that's, mm. kind of, yeah. that's kind of ridiculous. But, and uh, mm. I, I really, um, you know, I think that we have to be very cautious, mm. but you have to know what type of people are you dealing with. Mm. People who go, as you said earlier, who go to theater, mm. don't hug or yeah. you know, go into big crowds. They are focused on stage. Yeah. Exactly. They're not focused on conversing with each other or shouting something to each other. They're just focused on stage. Yeah. And if you have, if you have um, with artists, if you have, you know, constant testing, like they had, uh, I know here in Bayerisch and Wiener Stadtsoper, mm. I don't really, see, I really don't see a problem. Mm. Also, also with with orchestras and um, and choirs. I mean, it's mm. I don't, there are so many people who depend on that. Mm. And also in popular music, I mean, okay, that's that's a bit difficult to to really um, control the crowd, mm. you know, in somewhere where you don't have seats. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure if if all the things were were. But yeah, but I I'm thinking, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this that. Maybe a lot of it is because of, uh, say, politicians not being aware, really informed, you know, informed really what, what goes on in a theatre or culturally or... Um, and I'm also wondering, because uh, there's a lot of, of uh, talk and, and, and uh, you know, artists freelance artists feeling that they are not valued uh, yet and you you tell about the theater and the and the audience being very respective and um, and you know very eager to come to the concerts so of course I think there are a lot of people that are um, really aware and and are uh, maybe knowledgeable but then there's a very big part of society that's not not so clued up, um, and and I'm wondering if, if it if we shouldn't change the education system so that we start teaching children in the schools to be more, um, you know that you, you said now that that uh, or before you said that you were interested in sciences and maths yet you are now a musician so the 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 link is so close between the the, the maths and the music you know the the um yeah, so yeah, so yeah. and 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 i'm thinking am i right to to um did i understand right that that even mozart uh, composed in a way that mathematicians could appreciate the music. I heard something like that, that, that the music that he composed was in, in such a way that... Um... Well, I think, um, I think it has to do with, uh, with natural proportions. Oh, okay, yeah. In, with, natural, with proportions in natural world mm. and what nature by itself finds beautiful and harmonious mm. and very often the music that is the goes easiest in the people ears mm. has to do something with natural proportions oh yeah i'm not sure um i'm not sure if i can explain this i can only say that um 
you know, they tested um, water. Oh, I know this. Yeah. Using different musics, how yeah. it will feed. The frequency, and yeah. It, mm. And it creates completely different shapes in yeah. this tuning or that tuning. So there is definitely, you know, and all, all the things, living or not living, are vibrating. Yeah, somehow. exactly. So, and the music that is natural, that is created by vibration of some kind, mm. it has to be some kind of link. Yeah. I'm not sure if, if I know the science explanation for it. Look, um, about the education, I'm not sure um, if I can really speak about it internationally because mm. I don't think my son is only two and a half years old. Mm. So I have no idea about the education system in Germany or Austria or wherever. Yeah. Um, I know only about the education system that I went through mm. in Croatia. Um, what I think is that people don't really understand what is the grasp of art around them. Can you imagine that just, you know, you shut down the television, the entertainment portion of television and say, yeah. nope, yeah. no more movies, no more radio, no more songs. So you will live in silence and just watch news. Yeah. Or you say, uh, nope, you cannot now buy designers um, clothes, you cannot, because there was an artist behind it who designed mm. it. Yeah. You cannot buy, everything is just black and white. You cannot buy different furniture because that's also art. Yeah. You cannot buy photographs, no more Instagram because that's, that's art. Yeah. Um, so I think that people don't really understand what's the scope of art in their everyday lives. Yeah. That's something that needs to be said, I think, because, you know, behind um, the small poster that explains you how to put the mask and what are the things, you know, somebody thought about, okay, we'll put this in the right corner and this is going to be exactly. this color. Yeah. And the, you know, graphic designer said, or behind a... About, know, what, uh, behind what, our transport, you know, yeah. behind our what transport, there's a designer. Said, yeah. Yeah, somebody designed mm. that. Mm. Or... You know, when you think about, when I think about um, 70s, which I didn't live through. The I first did. Thing that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember 70s. So, I can that, tell you that it, there was no Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when you think about it, the first thing you think, yeah. oh yeah, hippies, and that was the music, and this was yeah. the visual. Yeah. How you can put, you know, the fashion mm. on those were the movies that people watched and the cars looked mm. like that and whatever. And when you think about, you know, oh, Mozart time. And then you think of, you know, you always have some kind of soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. That, because that's connected with the movie mm. or with a photo or with the documentary that somebody yeah. saw. I think that kind of appreciation of art should be installed in people, mm. not only you know, today is a show and it's about that. Mm. But also, um, uh, one of the projects that I'm working on is re reviving some of uh, Croatia's uh, composers and m music in general. Mm. And a lot of people are not really aware of how much of their own identity mm. um, national identity or identity of I live in this city or that city mm. influenced with art. And, um, you know, when I say, when I say to people, you know, I'm Croatian, they say, oh yeah, Dalmatia and we love the wine and we love Pershut and we love to listen to uh, Klapa singing and we love, you know, Arena in Pula and we like this or that which are more or less either natural, gastronomical, or art things. Yeah. And when you say, oh, I'm Austrian, and you say, oh, yeah, Vienna, you know, uh, yeah. uh, and you think about Mozart, and you think about opera, and you think about uh, New Year's concert, and 
those things. You don't think yeah. about oh, what's the what's the station on U3, you know? Yeah, um, no. no. You don't think about many things. Um, so I I think it's 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 essential to to um, make children conscious mm. of how many different parts are playing together. Yeah. Not only the economy and math, which are extremely important, or physics or chemistry or mm. you know, whatever, but also what are the parts of um, your own identity? Because yeah. um, I don't know if people would be very happy if you turn turn off all the art. Mm. Can you imagine that they you just cannot reach? No. Them? Yeah. So no art, okay, no, no Netflix for you, no television, no music in the radio. Yeah. I think that's how um, people would in two days realize what's art. Yeah. But you cannot do that because there is no, there is no mechanism to do that. Mm. But I think what could be really important is to, to teach the future generations of not only what's the... Um, you know, different periods of art or different types mm -hmm. of art, but also what are the little things of art present yeah. in our everyday life. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I, if, um, if I think at, at my, uh, back at my childhood, for example, uh, and I grew up in South Africa and we only had television in 1976. That was the first time television was available there. And before that, um, you know, we, we just, uh, well, we had radio and so on. But if I think my parents, when they were in their thirties, when we were little, uh, when they got together and and friends, you know, got together, um, the evening always ended with one of the friends, he could play the piano, and they would all stand around the piano and sing, you know. I can, I can so remember that. And somebody else actually mentioned to me the other day that, uh, you know, years ago people would do this as a family you know they would sing together and now we don't do this anymore because of course we have television and and the children all have their ipods and, and ipads and and things and i wonder just you know if if schools can or, or in and and i think almost it, it would be the artists who could send this message or who could bring this message across. So example for what you were telling me now, you know, you, the, the artists are the people to tell this, to say this, to mention this, because you are aware of it more. You know, there, there, uh, I think the main problem, I can only speak for my country because I don't really, as I said, I don't really know the education yeah, system yeah, in Germany. Yeah. Mm. The problem in, in my country is that there is a huge number, huge percentage of people mm. who are just struggling, you know, to, to perform the full circle. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure what needs to be done to, mm. to point to art mm. to people. I mean, I can... I, I can have some suggestions, but I'm not sure. Um, mm. But from Austria and Germany, I'm not really sure what to do, mm. learn or how do they. I only know. I mean, one of the our you know best best sellers in 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 Gärtnerplatz is Hans von Oh yeah. For the full theater of of, of school children, and sometimes we have this matinee in 10:30 mm. in the morning, where in the end children are so delighted with it. Mm. That they are, clapping and cheering and when when the hexa comes to bow they mm -hmm. say hexa oh, and you know yeah. they're really engaged and that's i think and also there is another show called, called pumukul that is some kind of a musical that they mm -hmm. really compose for children and those two are very very successful which mm -hmm. is 
probably a good example of how you can got uh, yeah. young audience to fall in love with the theater. Very and quickly. it shows you the, the, the love for it is actually there. It needs to just be stimulated, you know? The, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I remember, I remember when I was in elementary school that there were, mm. you know, every now and then in Zagreb, there is some kind of show, mm. like a, a theater show that gets so popular that you mm. cannot buy tickets for it or musical mm. um, so I think you know there are so many positive examples mm. how you can really do some things that it would be a really a shame not to use them yeah you, I'm not sure what that has to do with uh, systematic education mm. in schools I, I cannot speak to that but I'm sure that um in the classical arts, not only um, music, but also other art forms are so full of um, um, pieces that are extremely accessible. Yeah. Very attractive to, to audience um, from the youngest age. Yeah. I just, I just sometimes also think uh, that, you know, some children don't have the advantage of coming from a musical family or having the exposure to music in any way. And that you think, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if they could at least have that then at, happening at the school or, or happening um, in, in, in their education that they can make the choice or that they can explore it and as I say, not necessarily become musicians, but just having that opportunity. And it's the same as, as that we do maths and we do science and it's not all of us become mathematicians and we, we don't all use the science, uh, yet we are exposed to it and we have to learn it. And I think the same goes for art. I think it's very important that we, that we give the children the opportunity to to explore that, you know? I completely agree, but mm. as I said, I, I come yeah. from the system where we had that in our curriculum and yeah. every school needed to have that. Of course, the quality of different teachers is can vary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's the same in, in, in the other subjects as well. I mean, yes. it's the same, yeah. You can get a good math teacher and you can get a, a yeah. But I mean, in the curriculum, there is in Croatia, there is, you know, art is included in every elementary school. Oh, um, OK. I, yeah. I'm not sure, um, as I said, what's the quality? How much? Yeah. I know that in gymnasiums, you have always you have art at least two years and music at least two years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> In Croatia, there, there, the problems are uh, different. Yeah, yeah. One side you have the, uh, and and then the the music education or dancers education um, is very accessible. Oh, okay. Um, very accessible. Mm -hmm. I paid like for my school, I paid something like two hundred euros a year. Yeah. Something like ridiculous. So it was really, really accessible financially. Mm. There are mm. many music schools, um, elementary and high schools in 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 all Croatia. Mm. But on the other hand, concerts and theaters are not that appreciated. Oh, okay. In my opinion. Mm. So there is a disbalance between accessibility of music education in every school, the uh, specialized schools who are very accessible financially, and then there is a disbalance with how much afterwards do people really. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a not only a marketing problem; it's a problem of uh, we as a nation don't really brand music and theaters um, enough 
that's mm, mm. we do grant some things yeah there are things that are really respected but um not enough in my oh, opinion. yeah yeah I'm not really sure what to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. We talk about it and, and I yeah. think it's all this, this, uh, I think people should talk about what could be possible solutions. And I think artists are probably the best people to find solutions. So, yeah, and, I and I think also, you know, it's like you say, everything has energy. And I think, um, I think, you know, if, if, if we talk about something and 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 find solutions and maybe you know plant seeds and and just have thought processes then maybe there will be then an outcome that that would benefit the arts i believe that you know there is there is one sentence that uh, i'm sure you know what winston churchill said uh, when they said to allocate the funds from from uh, oh Minister yeah he said, mm. what, what, what are we fighting for? Mm. I think that uh, these kind of things need to be said from the mm. politician um, who need to not only, you know, not only invite the artist to sing or perform in any um, capacity yeah. when they have to show off to other politicians how great our country or our yeah. city or our region is, Mm. But really to support it all the time. Yeah. Um, no, I, I totally the, agree. Yeah. The spirit, and, the spirit, you know, the spirit of of a city or a nation or a region or uh, is most um, recognizable in arts and in mm. kind of culture, which is also created by gastronomy or yeah. art or whatever. So I think those two branches of the society that they're completely killed mm. right now are that that's a huge misunderstanding yeah. how we need people. Yeah. That's, but listen, that's just my yeah. <laughs> but um now just the last question. Uh, do how do you see uh the future? What what is your wish? You mean considering after COVID. after this is all over, yeah. Well, my wish was pretty much formed by one sentence I read somewhere, which said, "After horrors of the First World War and Spanish flu, the thing that happened in the whole world." was the 20s and it was okay. a huge uh, flourishing of arts and um, the new spirit of um, mm -hmm. both in Europe and in the United States you know jazz mm -hmm. music fashion um, a lot of things that um, that are down now staple of our popular culture are basically born in the 20s mm -hmm. or flourished in 20. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I would like to see happening. Mm. I think people will appreciate life much more um, when all this is over. Mm. That's one thing. You know, I'm I'm now fifth day in a quarantine and it's minus 15 outside and I can't wait yeah. to go outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was outside today and I can promise you it's not it's not so good. Yeah, but you were in quarantine for five days. Yeah, yeah. That's the other five thing. days. I'm like I'm yeah. like I cannot go I cannot yeah. go fast enough to touch the snow, which I really don't really? like. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, but I it's photographed like, I photographed the the Spanish ambassador today and I had to wait a little bit outside and by the time I started taking the pictures my hands were frozen because I didn't have my gloves on so <laughs> no I, I I can promise you yeah I think, but I understandably think... yeah because you you've been inside now the whole time yeah usually you know when I'm in Munich I didn't use my car at all oh okay yeah and, and now I left my car in Zagreb with my wife and my son. And you know, when I come back, that first rush when you start driving, yeah, I yeah, yeah. hope this kind of thing will um, 
this 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 example will also be um, applicable to the whole um, cultural um, mm -hmm. renaissance that will mini mm -hmm. renaissance that will happen after after the, all this is over. Um, that's that's what my my wish is. Mm -hmm. I also you know I the other day I talked to someone about um, the nineties mm -hmm. in in Croatia. So we had a uh, this huge war for independence from 1991 to 1995 mm. and afterwards i mean some of the greatest albums some of the greatest concerts um some of the greatest soccer games really? were in the back uh, mm. in, the, in the in the second half of the 90s um i truly hope that something like that mm. will happen to the whole world after all this is over even though you know some things will definitely be changed like this zoom thing which is basically awesome because mm. on the one hand it prevents you to to talk to people in person which is not maybe really nice mm. but on the other hand i can talk to you in vienna in real time and i can talk to my friend in finland exactly yeah and what i really like uh what i think also flourished mm. is the the medium of podcast which basically is you know oh yeah yeah talk show which was really popular before covid but now it kind of got this second huge renaissance mm. and um yeah i just hope that we will combine the things that we developed during this year or year and a half when this will be over hopefully yeah. in September with uh, some some old things that we like mm. from before and uh, because you know somebody asked me is this is this all is this end of opera and theater mm. and i said you know that opera and theater date from the greek times mm. <laughs> so there yeah. was a medieval time when everything was basically not really going and mm. then you had shakespeare and then you had monteverdi and then you had mm. all those great artists come and then there was a plague mm. and people die, would, were dying on a much much uh, faster pace than now however it survived yeah uh, there was a there were two world wars and the opera mm. survived yeah and, you know uh, theater survived and dance survived and painting survived and photography was born but you know it survived yeah. all of those horrible things mm. so I, I i really i just really hope that um this period of um for some people really huge agony and, mm. um, that it will make us be a bit bolder yeah a bit more, um fearless Mm. in terms of uh, you know really is is there is there um something to lose with trying mm. something new yeah you know so i hope it will make us also respect ourselves as artists um financially better mm. uh, respect our integrity with uh, institutions better I hope that it will strengthen the, the the bond that we have with the audiences as a performing mm. artist. Um, yeah, and I mean, I hope I hope for all the people who spent all of this time stuck home with their families that it will bring them together. Yeah. But yeah, because you know, I have I have a two and a half year old son, and during the last year. I mean, I witnessed his development <laughs> mm. basically 24 hours a day, which I wouldn't have witnessed. Yeah. Otherwise. And that's that's an upside that I will definitely cherish. Mm. Um, I hope I will cherish it more than I will remember the bad things and, you know, the, the anxiety and depression. Mm. And questioning my choices in my life and, and stuff like that yeah but I think uh you know if we if we think of bad experiences in our lives we we have really two choices you can remember the bad things or you can remember the good things but I always have this 
this idea that we should, um, you know, like when you have a string of pearls, um, that you take all the good things as a pearl and you string it so that there is, is, is a, a necklace of good things and you carry it with you. So you, you just remember then the good things rather than, you know, um, the bad things. And, and I think that if you take that with you, it's, it's something to build upon. Yeah, I, I heard a very, in sports, I heard, um, because I'm, I'm a huge NBA fan also. Oh, okay. I heard that nobody ever learned anything mm -hmm. from the successful shot you take. Oh, you yeah. You learn from, from the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, you don't learn when you succeed. Mm -hmm. You don't learn from that. You don't analyze that. That was good. Yeah. Like, yeah yeah <laughs> you know? no that's true that's what that's happened true. to me I will, I will tell you just the anecdote yeah. what happened to me before covid mm -hmm. i said oh my wife was pregnant in 2018 and we mm -hmm. had a concert in her hometown mm -hmm. and so that means i was 31 32 at the time and we had a concert and I remember she sang like four arias, I sang four arias, and we sang two duets and some songs. Mm. And, and the whole day I had to, you know, organize the pianist and bring him around. And I was the one who was trying to organize everything for her because she was pregnant. And, mm. and what I picked for myself in the concerts were four pieces that I love to sing the most. Mm. But very difficult pieces mm. and in one of those pieces on a high note for the first time in my career i cracked luckily it wasn't in vienna in wiener Staatsoper or in uh, okay vienna. yeah yeah in a smaller town where mm. people people found it rather interesting oh okay <laughs> And, you know, most of the audience was the family and friends. Uh, okay, yeah. But I remember what my wife said to me, and she was like, um, first, you have to realize that you are not a Superman who can do everything. Mm -hmm. Second, you have to realize that a voice is not a machine that can work on 100% all the time. So if you put the program together that is too difficult for you, mm -hmm. it not, you will not maintain the quality and a third she said you have to learn that uh, you are not anymore in age that you can go and perform when you're not rested mm -hmm. because the body as i said the voice begins to get heavier and heavier yeah. and you cannot you cannot go and just, oh, yeah, I'm going, just going to sing. Yeah, yeah. You have to really think mm. the performance, what are you doing, and be aware, and be rested, mm. and be smart with the choice of your... She, was, she said that to me, and uh, I think, um, you know, that's a failure, small mm. and very benign, Yeah. that um, I learned from. Similar but, things happen to me afterwards, but in a different capacity. Yeah. And it's just those kind of things that, uh, that you really have to learn for. From. Yeah. And I think that we as a society and as a nation and as a planet can learn from this. I, I truly hope so. Yeah. But uh, um, just to get back to your story, I, I sometimes think it's, it's great when it's not perfect, you know? I think it's it's more interesting when it's not perfect. Yeah, I mean, it it shows that you're alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember we had in 2017 we did Cenerentola mm. here in in Munich. It was a production of uh, Brigitte Fassbender, mm. and one show there was no sets. Mm. 
because somebody parked the car right in front of the gates where they were supposed to bring the oh my goodness. Yeah. So there was no sets. So we played mm. um, in costumes with props on the rehearsal sets. Yeah. And the audiences loved it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because we just had a feeling as if we were behind the stage with you. Yeah. Yeah. We could see how are you creating. Mm. So I was like, I, I was, I thought this is going to be a disaster. And then yeah. when afterwards we got some comments and people were like, oh, this is just fantastic. Mm. You know, people were really then paying, paying attention. Yeah. And they had a feeling as if they were part of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, that's also a learning curve. Mm. That, uh, um, yeah. People want to be also a part of it and that they appreciate um, when something happens. Absolutely, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. But listen, this was so wonderful to talk to you and it's well, so, so inspiring, your story. It's just amazing, yeah. Uh, and your insight in everything, it's it's wonderful to hear. And um, whenever you are in Vienna again, uh, write to me and then maybe we can have a coffee and I would love to meet your wife. And uh, it would have been, she sounds an amazing woman. I would have loved to speak to her as well. Yeah, she's, she's fantastic. And um, mm -hmm. we are planning definitely when, the, when this kind of situation stabilizes, we both plan to go to Vienna and work with Frau, Frau Wieska. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to, to end my um, specialization for Leiden Doratorium Studium uh, with Florian Busch. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out whether I will I will try to um, try to push that to the end, or I will kind of wrap that that up before mm -hmm. um, before the diploma. But um, um, yeah, I miss Vienna very much. I really oh, miss. I, really, Vienna. I have yeah. I have a lot of Croatian friends there. Yeah, um, singers and pianists, and um, I truly truly hope to to come there as soon as possible. We, we had some. We had some um, concert plannings with mm. uh, an ensemble called WISE, Vienna International Soloist Ensemble, mm. that is led uh, by a Croatian violin player, Andrea Nikolic. And mm. we also have um, one couple, a soprano and, um, and a pianist, Josipa Bainac and David Hausknecht, who are our very good friends. Mm. We're playing some concerts with them, but you know, it didn't. It didn't come to fruition. Oh, okay. So um, I truly hope. I truly hope that soon we will be able to come to Vienna. To do and when okay. when I come, I will definitely give you a call. Okay? Yes, that would be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for this invitation. It was so good to exchange the experiences with people. And you know, yeah. one one other thing that I learned in during COVID is mm. to appreciate this kind of long form calls and and talks with my mm. friends and colleagues. Um, because yeah, it's it's so much easier to live in the strange time when you know that it's strange for other people and when exactly. you're kind of yeah. to yeah. brainstorm the ideas of what to do next and um, kind of yeah. not really knowingly you lift up each other's spirits and um, yeah, thank I mean, you so this, much. Yeah, yeah, this is the whole idea, you know, that, uh, I mean, it, I, I've experienced it when I photographed uh, the artists in the windows that uh, you know, they know, they recognize each other. So sometimes when I post a picture, somebody will write to me uh, in, in a message saying, oh, I'm so glad you went there or, you know, or they know each other. So I could, I could see the connections that were so wonderful. And um, I also think in, in a way when, um, when they see each other, they realize they're not alone. You know, they, they, they know that they're all in this together basically and yeah. the reason why i started calling i actually started i, I didn't record uh, um the 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 first telephone calls because i just wanted to get information from other countries but then i realized also that it's important that that i uh, post because i i recorded this by the way as you see um yeah. and that i post 
some of these conversations because I think it's important for people all over the world to understand, you know, for somebody from America and for, for somebody from, you know, Italy, um, it's different countries and you in, and although you have contact with each other, uh, not, you know, it's a good, good way of, of hearing everybody's story because everybody's story is, is different in a way and, and experienced it different, but, uh, but yet there is a lot of similarities as well. Yeah. yeah. And what is great is that, um, you know, sometimes when you listen to people converse, you can also learn some new things. Exactly. As a, as a, as a listener. That's why yeah. I, I, I like this um, podcast world because sometimes it's a it's a such a good vehicle to learn new stuff mm -hmm. and to enrich. Uh, basically, it's it's like it's like reading, but you mm -hmm. can you know walk around or or exactly yeah or, yeah yeah or you know, um, drive or whatever mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. during that. So so I really appreciate it. Yeah. But have a lovely evening, and and I'm um, very happy that you will be out of quarantine tomorrow. Yeah, Is it your last day, or will you be out tomorrow? I have to do the test tomorrow. Oh, okay. So you'll have to go out to do the test. Yeah, I have to do the okay. test tomorrow. What is great is that in Bayern, we all have um, people who have wanted it here. We all have free tests. Oh, okay. So, and to 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 make uh, to make an appointment, it's really easy online. Mm. It's just a couple of clicks, and you make an appointment and just go, and you get a test result usually that day or the day after. Oh, okay. So, uh, when I get okay. if I get a negative test test result, then I can I have to send it to Gesundheitsamt, and then they can cut my quarantine to five days. Oh, because okay. otherwise, I would have to be in quarantine ten days, but. There is a possibility in case of the negative test, and I truly hope it will be negative. Yeah, yeah. Down, uh, to, to just five yeah. days. So, uh, okay. so hopefully tomorrow afternoon I'll be able to, to take a walk and go shop some groceries and uh, um, yeah, and also um, to go to work on Monday. Yes, well, um, all the best for that as well. And, uh, and I hope you have a, a great um, time and, and, you know, that the performances can carry on and, and um, yeah, that there's nothing stopping in the way again. Thank you so much. Okay. And thank you so much for this initiative. It's really uh, 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 not only brave, but really noble of you to do, to do. Uh, well, I'm, I, I feel privileged really that, uh, you know, I met so many wonderful people and then of course that I've learned so much in this process. So now uh, the privilege is really mine. The honor is mine. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Have a lovely take, take evening. Care. Okay. Bye. Bye. bye.